everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast. If you didn't know that, uh, why are you listening? It's right there on the logo. <laughs> and, uh, True that. And you know who we are because we're always here. That's it's our and podcast. If you don't know who we are, um, <laughs> I'd send you to the show page. But actually, the show page doesn't tell you anything about us. So it doesn't um, it? I thought no, it had our bios it, on the show page. Uh, used to. The old page did. The new page oh, doesn't. Oh, we have yeah. a new page. Yeah, the new page doesn't. So look, look at me all up to date on our on our brand. Oh, we have a new we have a new web. Well, it doesn't really matter, actually. <laughs> at the if you didn't know uh, at the time of this recording, this is not when we normally record. We're recording after lunch on a Monday afternoon, and usually we record in the morning when I'm fresh off the nootropic <laughs> rush of mushroom coffee and bulletproof coffee and yeah. all the good vitamins and minerals. And this is post lunch me, so. There yeah. might be an extra layer of snark and sarcasm. I've, and I've already uh, made a visit, had a chapel service, and that's had right. my picture taken. So, Oh, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's pretty much a whole day for me. So, <laughs> Right? That's a Monday. That's a Monday. <laughs> that's, Monday. that's Monday. But uh, no, we were talking before we went on air that uh, we're recording this uh, one week before Here We Still Stand 2019 kicks Correct. off. Yeah. So this so will be out about, that week. Yeah. And uh, selfishly speaking, I have a fight coming up in November, so... This is the time when I'm in training camp and I'm hitting it hard and getting mentally prepared and physically prepared. Well, this year I will be going to here. We'll still stand. So most of my attention will be on preparing myself mentally to rip someone's head off while simultaneously behaving pastorally around people that probably wouldn't appreciate that kind of uh, intensity in Southern California. <laughs> at, well, at, you know, just grab a cup of coffee and hang out in your corner. That's what, so yeah, uh, actually before we launch, uh, come and find us because we'll be at Gillespie's coffee table hanging coffee out. Clatch. Can, Isn't that what they call them? Yeah, clatch. Gillespie will sign a bag of coffee for you. And uh, if you have one of my books with you, at least one of my books, if you have five books, I'll even talk to you. <laughs> it's a high cost of entry. <laughs> Otherwise, just just bring the book up. Don't say don't say anything. Just bring the book up to the table. Set it on the table and stare at me. I'll sign it. I'll hand it back to you. We'll <laughs> nod and then move on. <laughs> there's, there, uh, so, that's some kind of social contract right there. I was going to say premium membership earns you a conversation <laughs> with Pastor Riley. <laughs> uh, yep, afternoon conversation. We uh, so we're gonna, chilling and willing, maxing and relaxing. That's by it. The way. There we go. Yeah. So we're going to dive back into our beloved professor, Dr. Norman Nagel, today. And, who, uh, who is, by the way, as Lutheran as it gets. He is, at, well, is that that's trademarked? a funny thing. Oops. He is, uh, is that trademarked? <laughs> no. That is, I, I think that is actually proprietary uh, software there. Oops. Yeah, right. Uh, he is to some, but not to others. That's why I said at the end of the last episode that he was lauded by his generation, but yet at the same time, many of his students in my own hearing have then also uh, denigrated him. And I think as we know culturally, we see this in the Bible even, we're in the book of Judges right now, no doubt Bible study, that one generation venerates a leader and then mm -hmm. the next generation vilifies them. And sometimes and usually, the, the, they're not uh, venerated until after they die. And you're like, too. oh, that was good. <laughs> right. Oops. Well, and what I find too is that they're venerated and vilified for similar reasons. Hmm. Two sides One, of the same coin. That kind yeah, of idea. Like, like a person can be lauded for proclaiming the gospel, but then the next current, the next generation comes up and turns their back on the gospel. And then of course vilifies the preachers of the gospel. Mm, okay. In like an old Testament example and judges, for example, right? Like every chapter of judges is, and the next generation forgot what God had done for their fathers. And therefore he appointed mm -hmm. a judge and then they got mad at the judge. And so with Dr. Nagel, it's very much that way. Uh, with Dr. Herman Saze, his spiritual father and mentor, it was the same way in, mm -hmm. in Saze's generation. And we can kind of track it back to Luther, even Luther's students, um, some of them turned on Luther in his old age and after he died and rejected his teachings. Whereas when they were at the, the university and they were his students, they, again, they venerated him. Yeah, like Agricola would be a good example. Yeah, exactly. Agricola, Karlstadt was another colleague mm -hmm. of Luther's that, and even him and Melanchthon got in their tussles and afterwards Melanchthon lamented the force of Luther's personality and its early influences on him. Yeah. And I think maybe that's a part of it too, though, is that I've lamented this certainly in the last decade or so is most of my mentors, and, and those of you listening may know some of them, Jim Nestigan and Stephen Paulson, because they're, they're at Here We Still Stand, and mm -hmm. friends, of, friends of ours like uh, John Pless 
and of course Rod Rosenblatt. These are characters. These are a, a generation of guys that were taught and mentored by true characters, and they themselves are characters. And I think, at least I've learned, because I think I definitely qualify as a character. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's why I'm attracted to them. Probably is mm -hmm. they're the type of personality that you either love them or hate them. Yeah, and you could try to lump them together. But sure. You, you, like saying Nestigan and Paulson together, they're, they're not, not the same. really the no. same. No. I mean, granted, they, they taught together. Well, yeah, and I sat with them for six and a half plus years and listened to them teach together. And yeah, they taught together and they said similar things about doctrine, for example. But as far <laughs> kinda as- kind of like you and I, I mean, we parallel play. <laughs> right, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's Nestigan does his thing and he tells his folksy stories mm -hmm. to drive home the point. And Paulson has his gallows humor and yep. his intellect and- so even though they're teaching the same thing, their approach to it is is different. And I appreciate that about both of them, but I watched them both go from veneration to vil to being vilified right. in my sight, even within one or two generations of students. Like I said, um, when I was introduced to Dr. Nagel 2012-ish, mm -hmm. um, I immediately fell in love with him and his sermons, his chapel sermons in particular. And then I was given access to this article that we're reading and other articles that he wrote and his dissertation. And it just deepened my love for him. And so when I see that this generation has no toleration for characters and they want to kind of push them away and retire them. And I saw this at the seminary when I was there of this homogenization of the seminary faculty. We want, oh, we sure. want company yeah. men and women. We just want people Get everybody to on the, the same line. party line. Yeah, exactly. Because guys like Nestigan and Paulson, for example, Pless, Nagel, they don't toe the line. And they can't be domesticated. That's the thing. And the reason mm -hmm. they can't be domesticated, at least the way I was told, is because they're like Luther says, when when the gospel gets a hold of you, you're like a dog that can't be put back on the leash. <laughs> and that's, Energetic that's, puppy, maybe. Yes. That's the problem is that these guys are like attack dogs for the gospel mm -hmm. and they yeah. refuse to go back on the leash. And so again, you're either with them or you're against them. Well, and I think we, I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but um, you look at like how St. Paul sends different of his own like trainees, right? So he sent, Correct. he'll send Timothy to one place, he'll send Titus to a different place. Paul won't go uh, somewhere where he might send Timothy because yeah. Paul knows I'm, yeah, I'm a little aggressive. Timothy's a, a little, little tenderhearted. Yeah. Right. And yeah. uh, they might receive if, him <clears throat> better than they'll receive me. And, if I could be there right now, I would rip my eyes out to prove how much I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's this idea of, you know, yeah, let's not, it's really party politics uh, yes. applied, applied in the church and like right. everybody's got to be basically cookie cutter almost All right well it's safe it's 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 safe it's it's categorizable it's yeah. definable it's easy to put in its place in its box well we want to be able to yeah nail people down you know to a particular right. ideology or series of ideas mm -hmm. and then 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 we've got it we understand them correct and then, right. and then what drives us mad and this happens with you know the vilified folks is that you'll be reading them and one thing you'll read is, is terrific and then you'll read something else and you're like i don't really agree with this and you're like right. now what do i do with that can <laughs> right. i say that i appreciate this theologian even though i don't agree with everything they say mm. well that's kind of the thesis of the show <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> like we can read we can read pretty much anyone it's and find usually find something uh right. worth retaining um maybe not a lot mm -hmm. but well, it's like we said at the end of the Bunyan series, even though we disagree with almost everything that Bunyan theologically says, I'll still read it and I'll still, you know, give it to other people to read to stimulate conversation. Well, I think, I think it was a practically or rhetorically a, a brilliant, you know, device, a way of teaching. hundred percent. You know, right. that, pure, that Puritan theology did a great job of it. Right. Right. So let's dive into this then. We're going to go back to... Nagel on the spiritual gifts in Corinth. We're going to begin on page 234 where we left off last episode. So Nagel writes, whatever then is said of such gifts, specifically baptism, the Lord's Supper, and then kind of as an aside, the office of the ministry as the preaching office of the gospel. Whatever is said of such gifts can only be said as integrally and derivatively related to the Holy Spirit, gospel, forgiveness of sins, means of grace located in the church and the offices of the church. And this is the way then that spiritual gifts are spoken of in the large catechism. Spiritual with a capital S. Big or little S is always the test. <laughs> I always thought that should be a bumper sticker. 
bigger little s is always the test. Mm -hmm. So is this big s Holy Spirit or is this little s human spirit? That's Correct. the test. Correct. Yes. While these are the gifts of this Holy Spirit, creaturely gifts are confessed as the gifts of the Father. The Father gives us all created things. Christ gives us all his works. The Holy Spirit, all his gifts. Large Catechism of Dr. Martin Luther, part two, number 69. Mm -hmm. Which again, I think is a bumper sticker. <laughs> <clears throat> and a great summation of the Trinity and of the Creed and of the teachings of Scripture. Yeah, I was going to say that does summarize the Apostles' Creed well. Yeah. And, but also shows the inter interrelation of Father, Son, and, and Spirit. Right. Uh, the Father gives us all created things. Christ Jesus gives us all his works and the Holy Spirit all his gifts. That's almost better than creator, redeemer, sanctifier. 100%. Because <laughs> I think sanctifier gets a little bit mm, what does abstract. What does it even mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What is it? Whereas, uh, you know, attaching, how does the Holy Spirit sanctify or make holy? He does it through these gifts. So, yes. Those are, and those well, are and concrete and real. We talked about that in the last show. And notice that Dr. Luther, Luther uses the exclusive particle all three times. Mm. All created things are given by the Father. All Jesus' works are given to us. All the Spirit's gifts of salvation are given to us. So, all and the language of gift or giving. Nice. So what is technically, what is ours in a neighborly sense? Well, nothing. It's all given to you. Well, then what is ours in relation to Jesus and salvation? Nothing. He gives us all his works. Mm -hmm. So then what's left of our good works? Well, nothing. Mm -hmm. Because even your good works from a human perspective were given to you by the Father to right. do, right. according to Ephesians. Yeah, but through Christ, through Christ. Well, what about... Yeah, well, what about the gospel and the preaching office and the church and the Lord's Supper and communion and all the stuff we... Holy Spirit. Yep. That's yeah. it. All the gifts of the Father and the Son are given by the Spirit. That's right. Yeah. So what's left to do for us? What do we get to do? Uh, receive. receive. <laughs> yeah, that's actually why we were created. So when you read Genesis 1 and 2, notice what happens in Genesis 1 and 2. Blessing, blessing, blessing. Right. Which is just the same as saying, here, take this. Here, here take this. Light, darkness, animals, plants, trees. Right. Sun. Moon, Everything. stars, it's yeah. all gift. So his gifts, quote unquote, his gifts is also said in the small catechism where they are set in contrast with natural or created gifts. Quote, my own reason or strength, mm -hmm. unquote. The Donia Creata is the solid declaration, that's Lutheran confessions language, mm -hmm. term for these things. And the same distinction is in the large catechism. These Dona Creata, these created gifts are individual mm -hmm. and they are not the same in each person. That is so important. We actually <laughs> mentioned this, I think, in the first or second episode about spiritual gifts inventories. Same thing, like you just mentioned uh, a little bit ago, the spiritual gifts inventory tests that I was subjected to were very categorical. Yeah, there was some projection happening. Yeah. It's like, here's the, here are your possible boxes. Riley, you need to fit in this box. Right. Good luck with that. Which yeah. is why I've never actually completed a spiritual gifts inventory. <laughs> yeah, you just, you're the kind of person where you, you, you don't save the box. It actually gets destroyed in the process. A hundred percent. Because I'm going to make a spaceship out of it. And the spaceship's going to go through an asteroid field, a la uh, <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. And <laughs> there's going to be some violence. And yeah. So these things, these created gifts are individual. And they are not the same in each person. Whereas the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to every Christian, such an important distinction. Brilliant, yeah. Is that I went to school, I went to art school, and I got scholarships in music, for example. And I have the gift of teaching and speaking. That's why I'm a pastor. That's why I've been called. And I can argue against that, but the Lord called me to this and gave me a voice and said, here, use your voice for this. <clears throat> Excuse me, it doesn't make me better than other people that can speak or preach or teach. It just means these are the gifts the Lord has given me. Right. But then I have people in my congregation who are large animal veterinarians, uh, accountants, bankers, mail uh, carriers, teachers, nurses, doctors, and so forth. These are all gifts that are given by God to these individuals for the good of their neighbor. Yeah. But when we come to church on Sunday and as the body of Christ, none of those gifts matter. Yeah. Because what matters is the gift of the Holy Spirit which is true and applied to all equally. And I think it, this would also be a helpful diagnostic when you're dealing with kind of the, the weird weirdo stuff in the book of Acts, where yeah, right. some of the apostles are given the gift of 
uh, of healing or of even resurrection or mm -hmm. s snake handling, um, speaking in tongues, whatever that means, speaking foreign language. They were all given that at Pentecost. Yeah. And th these, they're actually, they're, I mean, they're, are they worked by the Spirit? I suppose you could say that, but they're not universally given. They were particularly given to them. Right. Well, here's the thing. Does snake handling therefore bring the forgiveness of sins? No, <laughs> it doesn't. Does well, speaking in tongues. Keeps you from dying, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, if you get bit enough. But no, I, I've met numerous prayer warriors over the years, especially as a missionary. Mm, okay. None of that bestowed the forgiveness of sins upon me. Yeah. You know, so is it, a, is it for the good of the neighbor? Well, according to Paul, as long as there's an interpreter, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, being able to walk through fire and not get burned. Is, does that give me the forgiveness of sins? Well, no. And Jesus proves this in the Gospels. Robert Capon points this out in his book on the parables that, you know, what does Jesus' quote-unquote miracles prove? That they're not a very good way of getting people into the kingdom. Uh, yeah, seeing they do not see. Yeah, so he does all these amazing things before their very eyes. He raises the dead in front of whole crowds of witnesses. And they want to kill him for it. And they want to kill him for it. So... Hey, if Jesus would just perform signs amongst us today, then maybe more people would be in church and believe. Maybe for a month or two. Right. And I guess what I was driving at is the what sometimes people would a, a, assign to spiritual gifts would be another one. Like celibacy would be one. Sure. You know, it's, it's no, a creaturely gift. It's a creaturely mm -hmm. gift. You know, right. is it somehow make you more spiritual or if like you have the gift of fasting? I would say it's a gift. Um, some of us don't really do too well at that. <laughs> the gift of discipline. <laughs> yeah, the gift of discipline. Well, and here's the here's to my point, and I've talked about this before, is that I can go read Marcus Aurelius's meditations or Epictetus's discourses, and they'll actually communicate the same set of virtues mm. that mm. we often call spiritual gifts. But they're really creaturely. They're just creaturely gifts. That's why a pagan philosopher can nail it on the head just as easily as a Christian can who's confused about the difference between the spirit's gifts and the big S spirit and the little S spirit. And everybody gets creaturely gifts. That's the next paragraph. Exactly. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get it. So for creaturely gifts, we are then pointed to the first article of the creed. Since it is the creed's first article, it is faith that is talking. And that makes and contrasted, I'm sorry, and that makes all the difference. Mm-hmm. We have heard the creed equated with the gospel and contrasted with the law of the Ten Commandments. We have heard also how gospel and faith can receive the Ten Commandments as a gift and have good gospel use of them. And we talked about this previously mm -hmm. that yep. the, the Ten Commandments are not to be read in one way, but rather in two ways. One, mm -hmm. proscriptively, do this and you'll live, don't do this and you'll die. P.S. We all die. Mm -hmm. But then we read it a second way as this is what Jesus, this is a description of what Jesus has done for you by perfectly keeping, obeying the commandments. And so... Yeah, he's faithful to his own word. <laughs> exactly. So don't read the gospel or the law, the Ten Commandments as do this and you'll live, and that's the end of it because you'll end up in despair or self-righteousness. You read it also as this is what Jesus has done for you. Hmm. That's what faith clings to. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. And therefore there is a gospel use for the Ten Commandments. And this use, he, the Nagel writes, this use is characterized by unself-regarding eagerness and gladness. Such gospel faith use of the Ten Commandments may be paralleled by gospel faith use of the creaturely gifts, the Donia Karata. One may not therefore begin with talk of these creaturely gifts. Regarded in isolation, they don't give the gospel, as mm. we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. They may rather lay demands on us. Or lead us to, oh, there, there. Yeah. I may have read this before and been influenced uh -huh. by it, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they may rather lay demands on us or lead us to despair in their ambiguity and inadequacy, especially if we do measurements on them. Regarding the Holy Spirit, there can be no measurements. John 3, verse 34. And this is one of Dr. Nabel's famous little sayings too. No more mathematics. That, that's, that's how I heard it. it. Yep, no more mathematics. The law is all about measures and limits. The gospel is without measure or limit. This is why yeah. if, you ever, if you ever hear me describe the gospel, I don't use the term unconditional, or if I do, I qualify it by saying that is without measure or limit. So could you then, um, you know, he's talking about inadequacies or ambiguities regarding your own gifts or lack thereof. Um, you could receive that by way of faith and say, you know, uh, as Paul does, right? To say, this is like a thorn in my flesh, or this is the thing that right. I personally right. struggle with, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, my shortcomings actually are a gift to me. Um, if he doesn't give you what you're asking for, he does that for your good, for your blessing too. Well, we were just talking about this before we hit record, <laughs> this whole topic of, you know, in modern psychology, we call it the ego, 
mm -hmm. and subduing the ego. But really all Freud is doing is he's secularizing, well, in his case, the, the Jewish rabbinic tradition, the theological right. tradition from Judaism. And we do this with modern Christianity in the psychoanalytical uh, therapeutic movement is that all God is doing is saying, yeah, I'm not going to feed your old Adam. I'm going to subdue your old Adam by basically making you a gift to your neighbor and sacrificing yourself for your neighbor's <laughs> sake. A lot, and that includes not just your gifts, but also your inadequacies and your failings. Right. Right. You because if, if he spoiled us, I mean, that's, that's the expression we have, right? A spoiled brat. Yeah. I mean, you do that. What, what, the spoiled brat has no trust. There's no faith. Right. Right. They, they live unto themselves. They, right. they think they deserve everything because they've received everything. Right. Hmm. Yeah, and that, we were talking about this in adult Bible study. It, we were discussing how to judge a sermon, great sermon, good sermon, bad sermon. And I brought myself up as an example that I don't <laughs> actually believe the gospel, which is why I preach so much on freedom and slavery to sin and, and freedom in the gospel. Yeah, you keep fighting against it, actually. Right, I'm preaching against preaching. myself. That's why mm -hmm. I teach my people how to judge a sermon and then <laughs> say to them, now I expect you to hold me accountable to what I just taught you. Yeah. And if I deviate, if you feel like, mm, that sermon really didn't nail the Jesus for you of this gospel lesson, pastor, what's going on? Because you told us to hold you accountable. Right. And, you know, in a secular way, if you're a recovering alcoholic, you have accountability partners. Mm -hmm. Make sure to maintain your maintaining your sobriety. In the gospel sense, it's the same thing. Are you holding your brother and sisters in Christ accountable to their baptismal vocations? Now, you don't do that heavy-handedly or legalistically, but rather you ask, are you using your freedom in the gospel in Jesus Christ to serve your neighbor, or are you using it as an excuse to sin? Hmm. And as Paul says, those of you who are spiritual, restore one another in a spirit of gentleness and kindness and long-suffering and forgiveness. Charity, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we get that last part wrong, I think, most of the time, because we're so eager to, again, just attack and judge people and say, ah, I caught you. Which is just another way of elevating ourselves. but As, as if the Spirit um, doesn't deliver his gifts through inadequate means, by our estimation, inadequate, right? Well, I was going to say, I just said that I don't believe the gospel, so. <laughs> yeah, there's obvious ones. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I would, I, would <laughs> I would suggest he's binding, bound the word to, the word has been bound, I should say, to really inadequate things. Bread right. and wine, you know, mm -hmm. water. It's like, how can water right. do such great things? Good question. Yeah. Thanks, Luther. Uh, right. How can it? It can't by itself, but with the word of God and the spirit, it's a life-giving water. Yeah, I mean, if you just put water on something, it doesn't grow. Right. Yeah, no, we're not Mormons. We don't just walk <laughs> around baptizing stuff so we can take it with us when uh, we leave. Yeah, no, it's the, it's the power. It's the word that's attached. Right, it's God's word. Yeah, Jesus. Thanks. So back to Nagel. When we heard in chapel a little while ago such wondrous music, we could recall Herman Sazes pointing to the ancient liturgy, which speaks of the endless theologies with which the Lord is praised by the saints in heaven. But there are also those who at choir tryouts were rejected and had the disgrace of being <laughs> tone deaf, of not being vouchsafed such privilege of high praise of God. It is not a gift that comes along with the birth of faith. We either have a good ear and voice box as creaturely gifts, or we haven't. So this is one of the great again, thorns that I have been cursed with is that I can play a whole bunch of different musical instruments and I can pick up and sight read really, really well. That's how I got my, uh, my scholarship, my music scholarship. I can't carry a tune to save my life. My wife, on the other hand, whom God has given me is a professionally trained singer who mm -hmm. learned to sing arias. That's how she became a singer. So you have the ear and not the voice box. Got it. Exactly. Exactly. So people at church are like, Pastor, you don't have to sing the liturgy if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not <nudge, nudge. laughs> Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, everything done in faith. <laughs> I don't I'm know. Like, I, think, the, I think it's kind of brilliant. I mean, it's actually a great demonstration of the grace of God to see, uh, you know, a, a choir, a choir of less than adequate singers just kind of try their way through it. Right. Well, this is the funny thing. I, I always say, I'm always in key. I'm just in the wrong key. <laughs> but I am consistently in the wrong key. That's the point. Hmm. And likewise, yeah, with a choir, they may not be in the right key, but they're consistently in the right wrong key. So you can always count on them to be in B flat rather than C sharp. <laughs> but at least they're consistent. <laughs> so back to Nagel. One remembers Dorothy Sayers' words with regard to the acting of her miracle plays. She said that the first thing she looked for was actors and musicians who were competent actors and musicians. 
and whether they were Christians or not was a secondary consideration. And so the choir master, who annihilates the man for his wrong entry, is not calling the man's faith into question, but his creaturely gift and his use of it. Mm -hmm. The confessions, and in fact, uh, I have a friend of mine, uh, his daughter was dating an atheist. And so he, of course, the atheist boyfriend refused to come to church, but he had a beautiful voice. So uh, my friend hired him to be the choir director. Whoa. And then he became a Christian. (laughs) <laughs> and broke up with his daughter after becoming a Christian, ironically. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but you know who else is like that? Uh, uh, Suzuki, I forget his first name, is the director of the uh, Bach Collegium Japan. Oh, no and, kidding. Yeah, and all they did was tour around singing Bach. He was an mm. atheist. You know, he was Buddhist probably, or, you know, sure, whatever. And uh, yeah, now he converted. He's hmm. like, there's, got, there's something here. I don't know what it is, but there's something here. Um, yeah. work, the music's brilliant and uh mm. and that and then he saw it you know lutheran confession that that bach was giving in that in those texts there you go yeah so maybe I mean, maybe you don't need a christian mechanic that's kind of the opposite right maybe you just need a mechanic who then hearing the gospel the holy spirit may convert yeah have a conversation with him sure there you go so the confessions then the lutheran confessions have much to say of the gifts given by the holy spirit these are gifts given to every christian gifts that create a christian key there the the capital s spiritual gifts create christians mm-hmm. where there so, was uh, like, and that was one of the controversial <laughs> statements maybe for some of you listeners in the previous podcast was mm. no baptism no lord's supper no gospel no church ouch yeah and so without the why 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 say that well here's your answer because without the gifts of the spirit there are no christians the gifts create christians point is then that yeah wherever the spirit's gifts are at christians are created gifts located and given out by the means of grace, which are the location of the church. This is why when Seth builds an altar and preaches the name of the Lord, the church is there. Mm -hmm. It has an actual location where the actual means of the Spirit are given. And you see the church actually just break out in places where the gospel is preached. Well, like Moria, when God goes to sacrifice Isaac, there's an altar and there's an offering and then God provides it. That's gospel. That's mm-hmm. the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. Mm-hmm. That's the church right yeah. there. Uh, also, I, when the gospel is no longer preached, uh, the church scatters. It disperses. Exactly. There are no Christians. They're uncreated, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, un, it's undone. So these are capital S spiritual gifts with a big S. <laughs> what is of the Holy Spirit is not subject to measurement. We could just read that one sentence and do an entire series of podcasts. Yes. The spirit and his gifts cannot, and I would even argue law-wise, must not be subjected to measurements. How many people are at your church? As many as the Holy Spirit calls. How many people were at a communion this morning? As many as the Holy Spirit wanted there. Yeah. Well, Jesus himself says the spirit blows when and where he wills. Exactly. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name. Yeah. And for those of us with those of us with large families, we're good. Have church, we'll travel. <laughs> but the point is, I love that sentence though. And this is the thing that we talked about with Nagel is he says things in a sentence that take most people a book. Yeah, we we would say, yeah, he's a wordsmith. Yes. He, he knows how to craft words. I mean, maybe that's his uh Britishness, I suppose. Well, and this is also like we said, this is he's well at the other end of his career at this point when this is mm, written. True. So he is a very mature theologian. He's had time in the classroom and in the pulpit to refine these things. He's when very was this? efficient. What date was this again? 92, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're talking about 40 years yeah. preaching, teaching. Yeah. yeah. But just, again, for those of you listening, just chew on this. What is of the Holy Spirit is not subject to measurement. And how many of us have fallen victim to this? Hmm. Either of being told, well, it is actually all about measures and limits, or we ourselves have fallen victim to teaching and, and preaching in this way. Yeah, and I don't think it's just saying, you know, constraining this. Well, actually, I was going to say constraining the spirit sometimes is how this works. Say, well, the spirit couldn't yeah. possibly work there. <laughs> right. Like, what do you mean? Why not? Right. Yeah, why not? Well, in those people or in that situation, that's the Job problem. <laughs> or that Jonah too. Right. Well, I've said this before too, is that uh, I've baptized people in strange places. Mm-hmm. But I'll baptize someone in the toilet of a of a gas station bathroom if they call if the call is there, 
because if I have God's word and the Holy Spirit's there, obviously, if the person's like, I want to be baptized right here, right now, there's water, that's a baptism. It might and be slightly irreverent, but... Uh, it might be slightly irreverent, but the entire earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. As well as all waters. All God's waters. created all waters to be a saving flood. Exactly. When again. Jesus yeah. went into the Jordan and came back out, he therefore christened all, he sanctified all waters. And this is my point, is that that, many, that may offend our sense of decorum, but that's mm -hmm. all it is. It's just soft, gross piety based on upper white middle class virtue. Well, signaling. that's why I said irreverent, because reverence um, is the way of the law. Yes. It's not necessarily bad, just because mm -hmm. it's law, it's mm -hmm. constraint, it's restraint. Right. Um, to try to keep people from just being idiots or, or causing offense. Well, yeah, because you and I both know, there's a famous story, maybe you haven't heard it, but uh, previous generation, a pastor spit into his hand and baptized a kid. <laughs> really? Going into a church, yeah. They were the family came into church and he asked where they were coming from because they were visiting and so forth and so on. Asked if they were going to come to communion and so forth and mm. got on the topic of baptism. So he said, "Well, do you want to be baptized?" And so he spit into his hand and then rubbed it on the kid's head and said, "Good, now you're baptized." Uh, uh yeah. That would be irreverent in the <laughs> not helpful sort of way. Yeah, it would just cause unnecessary offense, even if it is well, especially when you're already in the church building. Yeah, is it possible? Sure. Right. Is it is it necessary at that point? No. I, mm -hmm. I would argue no, it's not. Mm -hmm. There's a font mm -hmm. literally 50 feet away. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is all messed up this week. So then, personal piety aside and, and all that went with that <laughs> conversation there. So the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a subjective genitive, is first the forgiveness of sins. And with that, the righteousness of Christ by which we are holy before God. When the Holy Spirit gives his gifts through the forgiveness of sins, you're holy. Well, Done. how do I know when I become holy? Are you baptized? Mm -hmm. You're holy. Have you heard the forgiveness of sins declared to you in Jesus' name? Then you're holy. Full That's stop. It. Yep. Full stop, exactly. Well, what about? Mm, there's no what about. There's no but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. <laughs> no. yeah that, that would be called a, a measurement or a limit right there, uh -huh. the but. Uh -huh. Again, grammatically, but negates everything that came before it. So don't say I agree with you, but because that you just betrayed your lack mm -hmm. of belief. Mm -hmm. So these are eternal gifts, eternal gifts in contrast with the transitory ones, the Donia Creata, the created gifts. They are heavenly gifts. They are surely every Christian's as they are bestowed by the Holy Spirit with the means of grace. Quote, for and according to the promise that the word of God preached and heard is the office and work of the Holy Spirit through which he vigorously, vigorously at work in our hearts. He is vigorously at work in our hearts as it says in the solid declaration of the formula of Concord, where this follows the warning against going by what we can observe with our senses or feelings. Vigorously meaning bringing life, right? Vigor. Yeah, yeah vigor, mm -hmm. life. And this is, I think, what Dr. Nagel draws out here is a key point, and this is why we disagree with Dr. Nagel, and by we, I mean in a general sense, because he just, he just drew out there. This is not observable with our five senses or our feelings. These are simply facts. According to the word. According to God's word, exactly. Mm -hmm. Where there's the forgiveness of sins, there's life and eternal salvation. Luther summary. Yeah. Therefore, right, is it a Luther summary. Therefore, when, when someone says, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ, that's a fact according to the word of God. Whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven, and whosoever sins you do not forgive, they are bound. Mm -hmm. John Those 20. Are, yep. Right, that's John recording Jesus' own words to his disciples. And he sends them out to baptize for the remission of sins. That's the quote unquote great commission. It does what it says. It does what it says. The word of God goes out and he does not return to him empty handed. Correct. Therefore, you cannot with your five senses or your feelings quantify the work of the Holy Spirit. Or evaluate either. Or evaluate, exactly. Right. So I think the Spirit's at work here. Uh, how do you no, know? Yeah, I, the Father doesn't care what you think. <laughs> you know, I would say, uh, is there baptism? Yes. Right. Oh, good. Yes. Then you're right. Right. Is the Word of God being preached? Yes. Sins being forgiven? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. no, the Spirit's definitely at work here. Right. But, but I think what <laughs> you and I have experienced is that you know, especially like in a small, struggling, rural congregation. Don't sure. know what I'm talking about there. People are like, mm, I'm just not quite sure right. you know, that God got, God's got us here and that he's doing his thing because right. 
you know, we're struggling and we're small and we got financial mm -hmm. problems and whatever, which again, right. creaturely gifts, by the way. And notice financial that's problems. all mathematics, back to your mm -hmm. other point. We're yep. small, we're struggling financially. Yep. Yep. Th these are all math problems. But my point is, is that you're, <laughs> you're trying to evaluate the spirit's work based off, off of uh, creature comforts, really, when it comes down to it, creature gifts. And say, hmm, are you doing the work that God has given you to do? Fine. Right, exactly. Don't worry about it. Like what? What? I'm supposed to worry about it. No, you're not. No, you're not supposed to worry about it. That's what faith is. <laughs> but I thought we had to be good stewards. Um, had to be, or we're blessed to be. I mean, that's right. a whole other conversation. I right? Suppose, Are we given but... to be? Are we gifted to be good stewards? Before the fall, we were. We were. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> After the fall, it's pretty clear we don't do a very good job. Yeah. No. We can't make a mess of it. <laughs> pretty much all we do of it. <laughs> So the the actual sequen, sequence that Nagel writes then, the mm. actual sequence is the third article of the Apostles' Creed, the second article of the Apostles' Creed, and the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Yeah, we work teach it backwards. It backwards, exactly. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit creates faith with his gifts. Jesus Christ gives us all of his works. And then the Holy, and then the Holy, the Heavenly Father gives us all of creation, including yourself, by the way, because you are a creature. Well, you don't receive God as Father apart from the Son. So you have right. to work it backwards. Right, Jesus introduces us to God as Father which is why it's considered sacrilege by the rabbis, by the, by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He says, to, when you pray, pray this way. Well, you, nobody can call God Father apart from the Son. Exactly. Right, so you have to work at least the second to the first. <laughs> but you can't know the Son unless the Spirit is sent with the Word and you hear. So the Holy Spirit, with the means of grace, words, water, bread, and wine, bestows the salvation gifts won for us by Christ. There it is. How do you, I can't go backwards in time 2,000 years to be at Calvary on mm -hmm. Good Friday to receive Jesus' blood and his words from the cross. It's impossible. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? No, you weren't. And stop singing it. It's not but true. But I want to be there. <laughs> I know, exactly. But I, I feel like I should be there. Ah, uh, no. feelings. Yes. There we go. <laughs> whoa, 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 feelings. <laughs> Point being then that we don't need to be though. We don't need to get in a time machine. We don't need to bend time and space to get back. By the way, that's a Roman Catholic teaching. Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. In the sacrifice of the mass, that's literally what the priest is doing. The sacrifice of the mass is he's re-sacrificing Jesus at the altar. And we are therefore by our participation in that trans temporally, it's called, spiritually transported back to Calvary and are actually participating in the death and the passion of Christ. Is that like a stargate or something? You, you would think, right? It's like an inception moment. Ah, yeah, nice. Right? <clears throat> but we don't need to do that, spiritually or physically. We don't need to do that because wherever the Holy Spirit is at, with God's word, bestowing the gifts in words, water, bread, and wine, the faith is created, forgiveness of sins is given away, and eternal salvation is bestowed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as Nagel says, the life of faith is living begiftedly and so on, then through the first article and all its creative gifts. That where is the life of faith lived? In creation. Doing what? Enjoying creation. Right. But you can only receive creaturely gifts uh, in faith right. if you know that they've been given to you through Jesus Christ. Right. Even, uh, by the way, your crosses, or like you said, right. the right. things that cause you to say, but but I, I lack this, or I'm unable to do that. Yeah, lack of creaturely yeah. gifts. Right. You cannot, you cannot get your head around that unless you know the love of Jesus. And I would say as an aside then, the other side of that is through faith, you also recognize that you can stop blaming God mm -hmm. for the things that you do to misuse and mishandle his created gifts, which I've talked about before, like in the example of alcohol. Yeah. That you take wheat or sugar or water, you combine them together and you turn them into poison by letting them ferment and then miracle. you drink it. Right. It's a miracle. And then you say, well, I just don't understand why God would let me make alcohol and then drink myself silly and hurt myself this way. It's, it's like, God's fault for creating those grapes. Right. Exactly. They ferment naturally right. when you right. press them. Yes. Right. It's like, I didn't ask to be born into this family. You're right. You didn't. It's a <laughs> gift. <laughs> so true. Right? And so we literally behave like small, ch like pubescent children when it comes to these things. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can you say it's a gift, Pastor Riley, when X, Y, and Z happens? Again, I got kicked in the head on Saturday, or punched in the head, I'm sorry, I got punched in the head on Saturday. I didn't then complain to God, hey, how could you let that happen to me? Because God's answer is, I didn't actually make your head to do that. So maybe not do that, and then bad things won't happen as a consequence. Hmm, maybe. You know, 
It's like, or hey, my, my th- just keep yeah. doing it and see or what happens. Do- exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then you can enjoy the other first article, article gifts that I prepared for you. <laughs> But the point is that I, because I, I get to ask this question a lot, and, and I'm not saying it's it's easy. It's simple mm. to, to see everything as gift. It's just not easy all the time. And no. uh, I just I, uh, had one of my widows pass into Christ's rest on Saturday morning at 99 years old in her sleep. She won the golden ticket. She died in her sleep in faith at 99. But then last week, my elder's wife uh, buried her mother who um, passed into Christ's rest by way of Alzheimer's. And it was mm. six and a half years and it was torturous and it was horrifying. And anyone who's been through that knows how painful a living death and mourning a person's death is before they die. Yeah. And my council president right now, his wife is in six years into her dementia and she fell and broke her hip and had to have surgery. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier to receive death as a gift. Other times it's not. That too, right? And, and, and you know, here's a good point since it's a little bit of a tangent, we can maybe wrap up with this. At church yesterday, when they came, my elder and his wife, people were saying, you know, oh, we're so sorry, we're so sorry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then after church, I, she came up and hugged me and I said, I'm so glad that your mother's dead. Because I had just preached on the widow's son at Nain about baptism and about remembering your death, that mm. in baptism you were put to death so that you might be raised to new life in Christ. And, I, and I, I've been through this with her now the last six and a half years, and I know what it's done to her and mm. the pain it's caused and mm-hmm. the hurt and the prayer and... That, that we've had of, of just take her, just end the suffering and take her. Yeah, not, right. not her suffering, she's not aware of her suffering, our suffering. Rest in peace, right? Exactly, rest in, in peace. peace. And so everyone's saying, we're so sorry she's gone, and that's not what she wants to hear, and I know that, because she's, she's said things about Jesus that, again, were irreverent in the mm-hmm. pain. And so I just walked up and we hugged and I said, I'm so glad that your mom's dead, because she's baptized, and you'll see her at lunch. And that was kind of the thrust of my sermon, is right. that, we're not, we don't look forward to baptism or to death. We look backwards to death at our baptism into Christ. Or do you not know that all of us who are baptized, in, baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Mm-hmm. So that whether I see you again next Sunday or not, I'll see you at lunch because Jesus is preparing a feast for us and he's setting it out and he's calling us to the wedding feast of the Lamb without end. Is it a brunch? It is a brunch. It's an eternal brunch. <laughs> it's the best. And that's my point is that we don't look forward to death as Christians in the sense of anxiety and anticipation of, oh, I wonder how I'm going to die. We look forward to death in the sense of, I get to go be with my Jesus. I mm. get to go and have lunch mm-hmm. eternally with people that I love, with the Jesus that I love. And no more sin, no more sinners, no more Satan, no need for gospel preachers, no need for the forgiveness of sins, no need to live in your baptismal vocation or listen to this podcast. Right. But if the Lord grants us life, then exactly. we receive that as gift as well. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So that, that's the all. flip side of that. Yes, 100%. To live as Christ and to die as gain. Uh, we're not suicidal or something. No, not suicidal, but accepting <laughs> right. death yeah. for what it is, which is it's just a Halloween mask mm-hmm. that the devil uses to scare us away from Jesus and baptism. Yeah, I, I pointed this out to the kids um, in, in catechesis, just that you know, it's kind of a morbid prayer, but you know, now I lay me down to sleep. Right, it is very apocalyptic. You know, yeah, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I mean, that's the end of it, if, if yeah. I should die while I sleep. I'm like. Yeah. It's not actually a bad prayer. It's a good, no. it's a good prayer, you know. Right. Because whether I die at, at three years old or I die at eighty three years old, so long as I'm baptized into Christ, mm-hmm. it's the same. It's unimportant when we die. What's important is do you die in Christ mm-hmm. or not? Yeah. And so if you die at three in Christ, you're spared a whole lifetime of suffering and affliction and struggle. Yeah. And close, you're blessed. If you die at eighty three in Christ, you're you're granted a, an, a, a remarkable. Uh, reward but it's gift mm-hmm. you didn't earn it you don't deserve it it's just given freely nice so unless in, unless you don't know that all of us who are baptized into christ were baptized into a death so that just as he was raised from the dead to the glory of god the father we too might walk in a new life go look it up Romans six okay. something 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 <laughs> so. so anyways that's all i got you got anything else this is good that's a good place to stop so we'll see you well when you're listening to this it will be after the conference yeah probably maybe even while we're there i don't know well there you go so good thank you for your time and attention we know it's important and valuable and we hope we haven't wasted it and we hope that we have helped you and strengthened you and given you comfort and we'll see you next week for i think another nagel episode there's more I i can't quit you peace